So we've all heard the story, I'm sure, of the guy that came home and said to his wife in the afternoon, "Hun, we're going to save money and we're going to cut wood. We're going to burn wood to keep warm now. And uh, you don't need to order any oil this winter. Of course, I'll need a chainsaw and a couple of things. And, well, and a pickup truck um, and a tractor. And yeah, we probably ought to build a shed to dry the wood in and whatnot. So, so the story goes. Well, same story with somebody that wants to be in the firewood business. And I'll just open up by saying, do not undervalue your product. Because just like the guy with the pickup truck and the chainsaw find, found out, it's not a cheap product and it's not cheap to produce. And I don't know this, I'm gonna to try to touch on a lot of different things this morning, whether you're just starting up, whether you're growing a business, whether you're considering maybe starting a firewood business, I'll try and hit on the things that you really need to know or possibly haven't thought about. And uh, what I'm going to do is go through, I got a series of these slides here just for a prompt, and at the end I'm going to kind of open it up to discussion, any questions and whatnot, or discussion between people, because this is what this is about, this forum is to share some information and try to make it profitable for everyone. So welcome to the business of firewood. How do you want to proceed? Like this, with a little tiny operation and some stacks of wood or wrap bundles that you deliver to local grocery stores or a great big machine that you're going to spit out, you know, 30, 40 quart a, year, a day and wholesale firewood in big dump trucks and take it off somewhere else or whatever. There's a whole gamut in between. There's the mobility, and then there's stationary. If you're going to be stationary, there's a few things you've got to think about. You've got to have a place, a log yard, where you can bring stuff. You're going to be making noise. Is it in a neighborhood, or is it in a place where it's going to be okay? Are you suddenly going to have a bunch of people angry with you about the noise you're making, about the trucks coming and going? Stuff to think about. Also, the spring of the year. When you want to get going, you got all your wood in there, was harvested all winter long, you want to get going, what's your ground conditions going to be like? Are you going to be working in a mud hole? Or are you going to be on high ground where things are fairly level? You're going to be moving logs around. So stationary is nice in that you've got all your equipment in one place, but that means you've got to bring logs in. You're going to have byproduct. You're always going to have byproduct. You're going to have sawdust. You're going to have bark, you're going to have splinters and whatnot. It's got to be a place to take that byproduct. So you don't realize quite how much byproduct you get until you start processing firewood, especially if you're up in the 500 to 2,000 quart a year um, range. You're going to have a lot of byproduct. And that's something that, that a lot of people don't think about is what am I going to do with that stuff. Uh, back up one, please. So the mobile side is, and that's a business model all in itself. You will go to the log landing and custom make firewood for people. And I have people that I've sold equipment to that are quite successful doing this. Although the business isn't quite as steady as one that you can grow from a stationary platform, it's more of a part-time fit-in, fill-in type thing, and you're going to be doing 7 to 10, maybe 20 or 30 cord at a time, packing your stuff up and moving it off somewhere else. So that's, that's a different, completely different business model, but it does work for some people. Go ahead. Are you going to deliver? What kind of a truck are you going to have? What are you going to pay for registration and insurance on that truck? <clears throat> Advertising, that kind of stuff. It all adds up. You're going to stack it and air dry it. You're going to dry it under cover. You're going to kiln dry it. You're going to sell it green, have it picked up at the place. There's, there's, there's all kinds of business models, and there's ups and downs to all of it. Green firewood into your truck and delivered in the backyard, easiest way to go. Drop in the, drop in the fines. Everything else goes in the truck, dumps in somebody's backyard, lowest price, too. Okay. You want to get a little bit more for your firewood? 
you may season it. Handle it one more time. Now you're putting it into a pile, loading it in your truck, taking it. This seems obvious, but if you're thinking of starting out, you really need to think about how many times you're going to touch this piece of firewood from the log until it's delivered. And every time you do, you want to have value added and be sure you have value added. Do not undersell your product. How about your market? Are you in a place where you can sell a lot of firewood? Is there a good call for firewood where you are? How far are you willing to travel? You've got to realize that it's going to cost you. It could cost you a dollar a mile to deliver this stuff. By the time you have the overhead of your vehicle, insurance, fuel, and whatnot, and your time, you want to be planning on that. So how big an area do you want to go? The other thing is raw materials. Can you get the logs? Do you harvest your own? Do you have your own wood lot? Or are you relying on the chip market or the pellet market and whatnot and its fluctuations to make logs even available to you? We had a, a, a huge vacuum in the Northeast for the last couple of years because people were bringing in their chippers right to the log landing and chipping up everything, tops, stumps, logs, everything, and taking it away and paying more than it was worth to bring out a load of firewood poles to a guy and, and deliver it to him to make firewood with. So all of a sudden, the whole, the whole uh, log market dried right up. And if you weren't cutting your own logs or really paying a premium, what used to get, you used to get delivered for $550 a load suddenly became 1000 So if you're relying on someone to bring you logs, you want to be sure before you make an investment that you're going to have a good long-term supply of logs. How are you going to move it around? Firewood bags is an interesting way to do it. I've used them. I actually sell the firewood bags. You can come right out of your processor elevator into these bags. They hold approximately a face cord or one-third of a cord cut and split to 16 inch length. You can pick them right up by the ears on the corners or you can put them onto a pallet and they will freestand on a pallet. You can pick them up with forks, move them around. They are ventilated and they air dry wonderfully. But you don't want to put them near an oak tree because the chipmunks will pick up the acorns. They don't chew into the bag, but they'll crawl right up the side of the bag and go down into the pile of wood and they'll make their winter supply. And, and these bags are wonderful. You can just take them down a little at a time as you use the firewood. So very little handling until you get to the bottom and you find you've got acorns that deep in the bottom of the bag along with your wood. And, and this was a mistake I made myself. I filled a dozen of these one year and about four of them I left, oh, not, not, 30, not 30 yards from an oak tree. And I'd bring them home and set it by the boiler and start working my way down and acorns are rolling down through and by the time I got to the bottom there were several bushel of acorns in the bottom of that bag. But the bags are a nice way to sell the wood if you have people coming with their own pickup trucks because you can set them in. They cost between $11 and $15 a piece. You can set the pallet in the back of their truck with a set of forks and drive away. Yep, go ahead. If you were reusing the bags, do you know how many reuses you get out of them on average? You get about three reuses out of them, three years before they begin to break down. So. Uh, what people are doing is they're charging the full cost of the bag the first time. So the guy is going to come and he's going to buy his face cord of wood and he's going to pay the $15 for the bag. When he brings it back, he gets another bag. And this, this works real well in areas where people don't have a lot of firewood storage or if they've got a camp or something like that, a skiing camp or hunting camp, whatever, they just want some wood, they can back up with their pickup truck throw it out of the back, just take the bag down. If there are any fines or bark or leaves in the bag, it's all in the bottom. They can pick it up, haul it off, and shake it out somewhere. It's very clean and neat. They come back, get another one, give you the old, old bag back, and it works out really well. And very little handling, except you have to get used to stopping your processor every third of a cord. And it's surprising how in eight, 
10 minutes, you look over and the bag's running over again and it's time to move it. And if you're working alone, that's time you're going to be using moving that bag around. But um, you go to Europe and look around and almost all firewood over there is handled in bags. And there will be lots with hundreds of firewood bags drying away. And it does dry very nicely. It's, it's thrown in as it drops off the elevator. It's not stacked tightly. The air goes through. I, I've had no mold issues. Uh, I, I've used them several times. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I do. I, I just I get five, six of them together and put a tarp right over the top of them, um, and it works out very well. Some I've air dried right out in the open. Eleven to fifteen dollars, depending on where you buy them. Yeah, yeah. I think my price is is like thirteen forty five, something like that. Uh, they are uh, they are made in in China, you know, uh, of course, like a lot of things, but. Uh, um, they also have, they've got the four ears on the top. They also have a loop on the bottom, so if you want, you can push them over and hook onto them with a chain or a rope and pick them up and dump them out, too. So uh, it's just an option. And then, of course, the other option is to have them come to you with all their cousins and uncles and aunts and grandmothers and whatnot and load their own wood and drive it away. Once again, you're not handling it. So, and then there's everything in between. Choosing the right machine for your business model. Notice the bottom of the picture there. There's your byproducts. Okay, that's the kind of stuff. I'd say that's a reasonable picture for the pile of firewood that you've got back there. That's a reasonable size of your byproducts coming away. And there are lots of ways of dealing with those byproducts, but a lot of times you don't have room for them or it's just extra time spent shoveling it up and hauling it away. So to choose the right machine, number one, you want to think about the size of your operation. What do you have for equipment already? Do you have a small tractor to move logs around or not? Do you need the processor to take the logs from the pile, cut it, split it, and put it in another pile? What, it, what is it you're trying to do and at what speed? And so if you're going to be working at less than 100 cord a year, you can start with a very small machine. All of these machines, you can look around and find them. They, are, they do hold value, and you can trade up. If you start small, you can see them on Craigslist and all kinds of places for sale. And that's generally when they're for sale, it's either somebody got into the business, didn't realize what they were getting into, or they're just growing their business. And a lot of times I will get people that say, hey, you know, I've got such and such a processor. I want to go to one of yours. Will you take it and trade? Generally, I don't like to do that because everything I take in trade and resell, I like to put a warranty on. And I'll tell them, just sell it outright on Craigslist. So these things are available and they're out there and it is possible to grow your business. And I don't know of anybody who has been stuck with one that they couldn't move along. So it is possible to start small and grow your way up. So you've got the little guys and there's several several manufacturers and, and uh, you know I just took a bunch of different manufacturers and threw them in here into this slide. Um, that little guy right there is built by Wallenstein. Hudson makes a similar machine. There's, there's several of them that feature a winch on the top that will connect to your log and drag it in and pull it up the chute and you supply your own chainsaw. You just cut it off. It falls into the splitting chamber, goes through the four-way wedge and spits out the end onto a conveyor. It's a very simple machine but it's not chainsawing the wood pile and the mall over your head. And then of course you've got your big machines with the air-conditioned cab and the 100 plus horsepower turbocharged diesel engine and circular saw and whatnot. So you've got everything in between and you've got a you've got a size you know what I sell out here really is a hundred to five hundred maybe a thousand cord a year machine. If you're gonna go over that you're gonna want a, a bigger investment, bigger machine. Go ahead. Okay, there's your simplest little guys. They start advertising at 
around $8,000, brand new. And there's the Hudson version right there with the winch up top. Pulls the log in, cut it off, you actuate the wedge itself. It's, it's nice if you're just kind of making your own firewood and maybe some for some neighbors, but I see a lot of things about these machines that are problematic. And, and one is, and it's not just Hudson's, it's all of this type of machine where you have your chainsaw, you're driving that chainsaw, and look at all of that steel that you can tunk your chain on. And you know what it takes to, to mess up your chainsaw chain. Not much of anything at all. And you can have it cutting in circles. And uh, I don't know, I kind of think you'd want to at least get to the point where the chainsaw bar is mounted on the machine and it can't hit the machine anywhere. Um, but that's just, just my thought. I think these are more a machine for the homeowner or processor that's going to make a very small amount of wood. And then there are the, uh, the PTO versions. Now, there are PTO versions built in the USA, and there are PTO versions built in Europe, and they're, they're quite a bit different. And the reason for that is, well, a lot of the re there's a lot of reasons, but the, the European processors have to come up to what they call CE standards, and that's their German standard for safety, and they have to be extremely fail-safe. They have to have guards in places so you can't get your hands to where they shouldn't be. I mean, if you, if you can get hurt on one of these processors, you're working at it or you're disabling some of the safety functions. They're, they're that safe. And you, you can <coughs> see later on uh, several, when, when we're running the machines, several of the machines that I sell are run by either employees or the wives of the owners and that kind of stuff or the children of the owners. And, uh, and they're very safe, and, and for that reason. It's to the point that the workman's comp insurance, for at least for that one right there on the right, is half what it is for an uh, American-built processor. So if you're going to have insurance, and this, this was in, in Vermont, uh, I only found this out because I sold the machine and... The guy had his insurance agent come back, and he went from $28 a hundred to $14 a hundred on his worker's comp because of the safety features that were built into the machine. So that's another, and, and safety features are great, but they're a pain. They give you accessibility problems. Okay, if you want to get into the splitting chamber, you have to open the hood Okay, for accessibility to the splitting chamber, even just to move a piece of wood, you have to put the hood back down and push the go button before it'll go. You can't just take a hook -a and reach in there and adjust your piece of wood and hit the button and go. So they're good and they're bad. But there is the insurance factor that I never even knew about until my customer told me about it. And, uh, and it, it actually cut his insurance worker's comp rate right in half. So the European processors are also more compact for what they're for their for the size of logs that they can handle. Now they go down as little as six inch, four and a half to six inch logs from some of the Scandinavian manufacturers because they pretty much run out of woods over there. And then some of the others go as big as um, like this machine that's out here, 19 inch diameter, which is a pretty good size log um, split six, eight, or, or 12 ways, depending on the wedge you put in. They're compact, they're portable because they ship them all over the world. They're also highly engineered and efficient because the Europeans have been paying $6 a gallon for their diesel fuel for more than 20 years, and they know how to get every drop out of it. Their input speed, PTO input speed, is 420 RPMs. Well, anybody around here that grew up on a farm knows that what you do, you get on the tractor, you put the PTO in gear, pull the throttle out and bend it over and run it at 540. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're mowing hay, tethering hay, whatever you're doing, that's PTO speed is 540. Not these guys, 420, because you're going to get almost the same amount of torque from your engine at about two-thirds the fuel consumption. And they figured this out because they've had to. We've enjoyed low fuel prices for a long time, and we haven't had to figure this out. 
So their noise level is also going to be lower, basically because they have to be. It's all part of the CE standards. So they're going to be a, um, a much lower, lower noise level, much more compact, and, and what I call a more, more finely engineered. And finely engineered is a good thing and a bad thing. Finely engineered means you can't drive to tractor supply and buy the parts. Okay, if all of a sudden you come by with a log and knock the joystick off the machine and you've got six wires hanging out, you're going to be calling me. Okay, and I'm going to send you another, another complete assembly. But if you smack the lever off of a hydraulic valve, you can probably go buy one off the shelf somewhere. So there's good and there's bad to all of it. I'm, I'm not here to sell my processor. I'm just saying these are the things you want to take, <coughs> take into account is serviceability, where you can get parts and whatnot. Can you work on it yourself? Do you want to work on it yourself? And safety. Keep safety in mind, though. When you look at machines, think about safety. Think about where your employee your wife, your children, might put their hands, okay? It's one thing if you're the owner-operator, you're responsible for it, but the minute you start bringing in help who might be distracted, who might have a cell phone, who might have a girlfriend, whatever, are they going to be safe? And it's just something you want to think about when you're looking at these machines. Back, back one. Okay, engine drive self-contained machines. They have an awful lot going for them. I wish I could say that I was bringing in an engine drive self-contained machine because you can hook them behind a pickup truck, you can take them to the job, or you can set them up in a stationary site. These guys here are probably the most popular wood processors out there right now. They've got their own engine, their own power plant. You can fold them up, take them somewhere behind a truck, set them up, and put them to work. The features of them are, in my opinion, a little bit, well, I don't want to say archaic, but they're, they're, they're very simple. They're extremely simple and sometimes a little harder to work. A little, uh, I, there are, I, I, want, I looked at one in Ohio last year that was an engine drive mobile unit. It had eight hydraulic levers, a foot pedal, and a button. So not only did you need to be an octopus, you also had to have one foot and, a, and, a, and, a, and another hand for the button. And if you watch somebody that's used to running it, it was kind of like playing an organ, you know, they got it going. but. It was possible on that machine to advance the log while the saw was in it. Okay, it was, it was a new startup company and I'm sure it will get refined because people will make those mistakes. But when you look at a machine, make sure you can't self-destruct that machine if you make a mistake because that gets expensive and once again gets dangerous. These guys here are available in a very wide range and a very wide price range too, um, you know, twenty-five to forty, fifty thousand dollars, and you can be into a machine that's uh, that's going to handle fairly good size logs, and uh, and make a nice product for you. Go ahead. Then we have these that I call the wood monsters. They have their place. Absolutely, do not think that I don't mean just by calling them wood monsters. These are the guys that are roaring, and you can hear them six blocks away, and when that blade comes down, a zing, crash, I mean, they make firewood, and they make it fast. No question about it. And they probably, even though they got that great big diesel engine running at full RPMs, with the amount I've watched the wood coming off of their conveyors, and they're probably doggone efficient, too, as on, on fuel consumption. But if you're going to own one of these, number one, you're going to have a big investment up around $100,000, and you're going to make some noise, and you're pretty much probably going to be stationary and need a lot of ancillary equipment. 
You know, you, by stationary, you can make a giant pile of wood and then move it a few feet and then make another giant pile. There's several people that do that, and they'll cover a half an acre with firewood 18 feet deep and in a fairly short amount of time. But these guys here are, these are the creme de la creme of the, of the firewood processors. And another thing I want to say about firewood processors, I get so many people that walk in and ask me, how's it do with crooked wood? A firewood processor for speed and efficiency is made for straight poles. That's what they're made for. You can put limb wood through them, especially your small machines that are down close to the ground. But if you've got a live deck that's up here and you need to twist a log around to feed it in, instead of taking 40 seconds to do that 18-foot log, all of a sudden it's taken you five minutes. Where's the efficiency in that? And you need to know that going in. If you're going to have a firewood processor, you're going to want to look for wood as straight as you can. Sure, a lot of logs have sweep in them. That's not really a problem. But the real twisted sisters or the limb wood, save them for the chainsaw, really. Um, I have people that have firewood processors that they'll cut wood down to four feet so they can put it through. Well, two more cuts and you've got it to stove length with your <laughs> chainsaw. So for efficiency purposes, <coughs> get straight wood. And yes, I love to get a crooked piece of wood on my live deck and show people how it can go through and it impresses people. It doesn't really impress me because all of a sudden I'm going, like I say, from 40 seconds to a full length log down to three or four minutes and rolling and turning and whatnot and, and there's just not a lot of efficiency in it. So look for poles. Make sure you can get the right size wood for your processor. If your processor maxes out at 18 inches, Tell your log supplier, bring me 14 inch max, because I'll tell you what, from up there in that harvester, they can't tell the difference between 14 and 18 or even 24. I mean, I, I, uh, I talk to people about at these shows, you know, I, I've got a machine that does 19 inch max wood. I tell them 12 inch max, I'll get to the show and I'll find places with cross sections 22, 23 inches. Their rulers are different than yours are, okay? What will, fit in, what will fit in your processor and what they see from the cab of that harvester are two totally different things. So ask for smaller wood if you're, if you're having wood delivered to you. Ask for something two-thirds the size of the capacity of your harvester and maybe there'll only be one or two logs in the load, or your processor, maybe there'll only be one or two logs in the load that won't fit into your processor. It's another thing you want to make sure you've got a wood splitter and a chainsaw around. At least a chainsaw and a cant hook for moving logs. Another thing with a crooked log, especially one that's got a lot of sweep to it. If you've got a 16 foot log that's got a belly in it like this of sweep, a couple of cuts with a chainsaw three quarters of the way through and that log will lay right down flat. Okay, and those cuts will open up. Sure, they may not come right where your cuts are, but it's going to feed a whole lot nicer. So before you put it on the live deck or while it's up there, just as soon as you set it on, a couple of strategic cuts, just enough so that log relieves and lays down flat. Life gets a whole lot easier. Rather than, and because also logs laying on a live deck, especially if they're stacked deeper, if they've got a sweep to them, they're going to want to twist around each other. And then you've got to untangle logs. So just for efficiency, and, and smoothness of movement, make a couple of cuts, lay that dog, log down flat. And if you get a piece of firewood that's got a cut part way through it, well, you may have to sort that out. Chances are, though, if you're running a machine that's going that fast, everything's going up the conveyor. Go ahead. Okay, available options on processors are this one here happens to be a, a chip separator, so before it goes on to the conveyor, there's usually some sort of a place for chips and fines, bark and whatnot to fall out. The sawdust often comes off the bar or the blade and goes somewhere else already. Okay, so what makes it up after the splitting chamber, the pieces of bark, the little fine splits that come off of your six-way wedge when you'd had it just a little too high or a little too low, they're going to come up here. They're going to fall onto that graded piece 
fall through the graded piece and off the chute and make a pile on the ground, your big chunks of wood go in your trailer. So that's one way to do a little bit of quality control kind of by the help of gravity. Go ahead to the next. But there are, there are other ways. Now each one adds a cost. This is a tumbler right here which rotates so you're coming off of your conveyor, you're going into your tumbler, your fines are falling out back in the pile, you're getting very nice clean wood out the other side. It's another step, it's another bit of investment, and if you have that investment, do not undervalue your product. Upcharge your product because you will be able to sell it, especially after a couple of years when you dump the load of wood in their fire, in their, on their lawn, and they take and they stack it up and they don't have to get out the rake and shovel and clean up a trash barrel full of refuse off the lawn, you're the guy that's going to be called. I have a guy that uh, has two processors and <clears throat> his wife makes all the firewood because she's picky. He said, I don't care how long it takes you to make a cord of wood. He said, I want it clean. And she stops that conveyor six times a minute to pick off stuff and then starts it again. And whatever goes to the truck is nice. He gets $300 a cord. He doesn't go any further than 15 or 20 miles from where he is. And he sells all the wood he can make because it's clean wood. So that's, there, there is a, a good reason for those investments if you're in a place where people will pay that kind of money. How high do you need to stack it? What, what kind of room do you have? Are you going to cure it outside like this? Is this the way your wood's going to be seasoned or is it going to be moved along? There's all kinds of elevators available out there. Go ahead. F from small, simple guys like this to 50 footers and a, a host of manufacturers so they can start as little as $2,500 a piece and run up into the tens of thousands depending on how high you need to stack it but there's always a way to get it up there if you need to and a lot of these manufacturers are at the at the uh, firewood expos and the, the logger shows and whatnot and they'll uh, they'll hook you <coughs> up with what you need things to look for at the expo okay you really need to, instead of just going to one dealer, if you go car shopping, do you always go to the same dealer? Some people still do, but more and more people shop around. And I strongly recommend you go to the expos. Go to, well, in, in our area, there's a Northeast Logger Show that goes swip, swip, swaps out between Vermont and Maine. They have one in New York sometimes. Uh, Pennsylvania has a logger show that has a lot of a lot of people there up at State College, Boonville, New York. I'll tell you, that's my favorite, absolute favorite. That to me is one of the best shows, and not just as an exhibitor, but as the amount of equipment you're going to see there. As an exhibitor, I love it because they bring me all the all the firewood logs I need, and it's all the wood is pre-sold. And and you know, there's a lot of these shows we go to. We're paying $200 a cord for our logs, and the wood goes away to somebody else. So I, I like Boonville in that they bring you the wood you need, and it goes into somebody's pickup truck or a big uh, um, roll-off dumpster or something like that, and they haul it away. And you don't have to worry about selling it afterwards. You don't have to have the wood Nazis coming around, hey, hey, can I buy your pile of wood, you know, that kind of stuff. So as an exhibitor, it's very nice. How am I doing? Am I running over on you? Oh, 10's fine. Well, I'm wrapping up here pretty soon. So you want to look for simplicity of operation when you go to the expo. There you can actually see them work. It's not an over the phone conversation. It's not a YouTube video. You can, you can see them work. You may not be able to try them. I know that my insurance company tells me no don't have people run the processor at the show, okay? I can bring it to your place and demo it, you can try it there, but don't do it at the expo. So you may or may not be able to actually try one out. <clears throat>
<clears throat> Look at safety. Look at what's exposed, what's not exposed. Think about, and this is all individual, who's running it? Is it you? Is it your wife? Is it your kid? Is it an employee? Quality of the finished product. Look at the pile of wood that's under the machine. Look at what's come out of it. Have, have there been logs that big around run through a four-way wedge and you get all these things that your customer is going to have to put through a wood splitter again before you can put them in his stove? Or is it going to be the product that you want to deliver? Serviceability. Can you get parts for it? Where, the, where are the parts? Do peop, are there people who have had factory training for servicing these guys when you call? Can you explain what's going on and can they help you out? The hourly output. Now the hourly output is something that can be a lot of things. Now a lot of us have competed in the, uh, in the firewood shootouts and gee, yeah, my machine put out 5.6 cords per hour. Well, guess what? That was one live deck full of maximum logs that I ran for 17 minutes. And then they calculated out to over five cords an hour. Reality is two cords an hour. You gotta load your live deck. You're not gonna have maximum size logs. Some of them are gonna be this big around. You still gotta make the cut and run it through the split cycle every time. So output, basically watch the machine. See if it has a smooth flow of material and whatnot. <laughs> Get the figures from the people you know and see what they're see what they're telling you on output but if you're doing if you've got a two cord an hour output you got a pretty good output by the time you're loading live decks moving trucks that kind of stuff you're doing you're doing pretty well actually will it fit my budget you got to think of all the other things that go along with it everything else your wood lot getting rid of, getting, getting materials in, what are you actually going to make on that, on that cord of wood by the time you get done? Figure it all in and see if your processor can fit into that business, business plan. And then think about what else do I need and ask what else do I need to make this whole thing work? Go ahead. <clears throat> Basically, some processors dump, dump the wood off right here, that high. So you, you need an elevator. So will the discharge conveyor reach a truck? Do I need another elevator? Do I want to stack it? Do I need an even bigger elevator? Do I need to have buildings to put it under? Just think of everything before you make the jump and then your machine won't be on Craigslist in another year so that you can keep the banker from attaching your house or something like that. Look at it all, make your business plan, and most of all, do not undervalue your product because it is a good value product. It is usually competitive with heating oil. Not this year, though. This year, it was tough, and a lot of people just turned up their thermostat and called the oil man, and, and a lot of people noticed a drop, at least in the Northeast, a drop in their firewood sales because of that. That's not forever, okay? Elections are almost over, folks. We're gonna be we're gonna be paying more for our heating oil. Any questions or discussion? We got plenty of time for questions, Yeah. Well, um, anybody want to talk about you know anything? What they're what you're looking to do? Or, yeah. With those bags, uh, you uh, dump it into. No, you don't. You put, them, you put it on a frame. You have a frame that will hold a pallet on the bottom and two arms up the back with a couple of, couple of horizontal arms, and you put the ears of the bag right on those arms. So you're holding the bag open. The bag, the opening, I believe, is, I think it's 42 by 36 is the top opening. It's, it's a rectangle. Anyway, um, and then they're 66 inches tall. About a third of a cord. So you'll fill that bag just dropping in from the elevator. Just let it fill up. You don't have to mess with it and shuffle it around or whatever. You just let it fill up. And when it's full, then you can pick the pallet with your forks. You don't have to pick it by those ears. You can just drive in with your forks, 
lift the pallet and back away and the ears will slide right off the arms that were holding the bag open. Um, it, it, is a, it is a unique way to handle it and it, it's very easy. And there's no stacking involved to get it dry, which is, which is very nice. And it will dry as fast. It will dry. It dries. It dries wonderfully. I mean, you can, you can't. I won't say see through the bag, um, but the air can go through it. The the holes are you know eighth inch maybe in it, um, and and it's it's a weave. It's a very coarse weave. <laughs> Extremely rugged though. You can pick those bags up. They'll hold 2,500 pounds, and you can pick them up with the forks and shake them. Um, and I've done that to demonstrate before too. I'll. I'll uh, I'll take one and, and grab it right in the four ears and pick it up and shake a, a full load of green oak. And, and they hold. They're, they're strong. Anything else? Yes, sir. Do you have any of your clients dealing with uh, kind of last floor or Thank you very much. Quarantines. That's something I wanted to, yes, we do have emerald ash borer in the Northeast now. And of course, it started out in the Midwest and worked its way all the way across. There are quarantines in place in a lot of places. You need to check on quarantines for your wood. How far you can actually move that wood and really please, please pay attention to quarantines. A lot of people do not and they just poo-poo it and say, ah, forget it, I'm selling my wood, that's that. Well, you know what, there is a real reason that they're trying to keep this stuff contained until natural predators can be brought in to handle to uh, control these things. We've lost too many really nice woods, like your Dutch elm, your elm. We've lost um, the ash are going now, hemlock. Hemlock woolly adelgid has pretty much cleaned them out up the east coast, well into New England already. These quarantines are for a reason, and they're not just to put us out of business. They really are because the Forest Service and and other agencies are trying very hard to find the natural predators that work on things like emerald ash borer that get here from, from Asia and cannot, you know, they, they can just run rapid because there is no natural predators. So please, please respect the quarantines. Yeah. Most of them are doing heat treatment. Yep, yep. Most are doing heat treatment. Um, and then there's the, uh, in especially in Massachusetts, we had the Asian longhorn beetle outbreak there, and that nothing could be made into firewood. That all had to be chipped into one inch or smaller chips, and then burned. And uh, you know they've got and then and then trees outside of the radius were all treated with imidacloprid uh, in root injections to hopefully stop the outbreak. And I know it's been about eight years now and uh, they're still finding here and there one or two. Luckily, the uh, <clears throat> Asian longhorn beetle isn't a strong flyer, probably not in my lifetime, but maybe in my grandchildren's lifetime, unless they find a natural predator for it, it may take the rock maple too. So, you know, we are losing we are losing valuable timber and valuable species. And that's one thing we have in the northeast of the United States is a diversified forest like none other in the world. So please do respect quarantines. They are there for everybody and for our forest. That was, some, that was a point I was going to make too. And thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? Get up and stretch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.